all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Mdavi forgot to mention that he's the one who taught me law. However, I really appreciate that and I'm saying it for the first time. Indeed, I am an attorney who is running an office in Kempton Park. It's true that I've been running marathons since 1987-88. However, um, because of some commitments, I sometimes give myself a rest. Yes, having been introduced as an attorney, I think I can assist in advising and indicating your problems around the issues of law. But when Mr. Mdavi invited me, <coughs> he did not give me a topic, but I understand why he did not give me a topic. Pa the pastor indicated that sometimes to be given a topic you are being limited, but Sometimes it works against you because you don't even know what to tell the people. Uh, when I met him now, 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 10, 15 minutes ago, he said, just go and tell them your experience in law. I said, my experience in law is not going to assist anyone. He said, no, tell them about the daily problems that you face in your office. I said, okay, no problem. I'll try to think of one. But there is an interesting theme that I believe you are dealing with. Stay on track. I think I should definitely add that you should stay on the right track, not only on track. And how do you then stay on the right track? You got to differentiate the wrong and the right track so that you should, you should go to the right track and stay on the right track. The question still remains, how do you differentiate the two? You got to comply with the constitution of life, the constitution of the country in conjunction with the law of the country. Now, what is the constitution of life? It should be, if it, it is the Bible that you read every, every day, I regard that as the main constitution. And the constitution of the country is, according to me, regarded as the constitution that we use in our country. It cannot be said that the constitution is valid if it is not in line with the Bible. And we got to again comply with the laws of our own country. Now, the question again comes, how do I know the law if I haven't done the law? I will refer you to Exodus 20 it will definitely give you a light as to what you have to do and what you don't have to do. And surely Christians and people who are not Christians are affected by, by what is happening in this country. You cannot run away from it. You go to get married or be married. No doubt we end up dying 
and that is where the law comes in. I thought of talking about marriages because this is what we receive on a daily basis and it becomes a problem. We never thought that that is a problem. We thought it's generally known. People get married and choose the matrimonial system that they choose sometimes not understanding the consequences thereof. It's only when the marriage dissolves, which we don't pray for. When you get married, you don't even think of it coming to an end one day. And after choosing that matrimonial system, because that is the best, and it's the best without knowledge. You don't know the content thereof. You only realize that it was a bad choice when you end up your marriage or something ends up your marriage. There are people who get married in community of property. This is well known. I think 99.9% .9 of people would choose that type of marriage. It sounds very simple that when you are married in terms of uh, 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 civil and in community of property, when, you, when the marriage comes to an end, you divide. There are those who have been told about the out of community of property, which is not being appreciated by parties. And when you end up your marriage, you sometimes don't divide because you did not choose what we call a cruel system. But that is not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is customary marriage where a lobola is paid and accepted. And when the marriage comes to an end, one party or one partner stands up and say, Ang zang ang saine pants nai. Atungo vi anda saina nabo, banga si vievan divorce. It cannot, you, we cannot go to court and divorce. It's not true. What is true is that once Lobola has been paid and accepted and something goes wrong, you still end up in court. And you still have to talk about the division of the joint estate. Mata fika e koto ku fika ku divide wa su ilesu minga na so. Now, that is one of the areas of the problem that we normally face every day of our life where a person comes and say, I have documented someone, she, she or he is divorcing me, but I did not sign. So, this customary marriage is recognized in our country and it goes further, it goes to court as well and people are to deal with it um, the same way they deal with the other marriages. Now, we, as I have already indicated that uh, there is death that does not even select. It goes to every person. Doesn't matter whether you are Mr. Islam Lela in Atene or you are Mrs. X, a housewife. It will come. Now, in each and everything one has to prepare for or rather, 
one has to prepare for everything, death, life. In death, there are people who die without will because they did not even know whether they have to draft will or they knew, but one does not even think that death will come to him one day. You don't even think it will really, really visit your, your house. So you think that is the will is to be drafted or, or must be prepared by those that those who think they are going to die, not you. There are consequences of death or rather a person who died without will. One of the consequences thereof is that your assets will be divided. No doubt about that. Your assets will be divided. But it is not going to be divided in accordance with your will. It will be divided in accordance with the law. So if I were to advise people I would advise them to really think of how their assets should be divided after death and draft a will to that effect. Because after your death, it doesn't matter what assets you're talking about, whatever you have is your asset, whether death or, or whatever. So if you want, to, want it to be divided according to your will, the best advice would be draft a will and indicate as to how you want your assets to be divided. I also indicated that even if you don't have a will, your assets will be divided. But it becomes very, very difficult because sometimes it, it, it cannot be divided in a way that suits even those people, beneficiaries who are there. I'll tell you what I mean by that. There are houses in, in all townships, not only Tembisa, because we have already consulted with a lot of people from different townships regarding, regarding this Interstate Succession Act, where you find that Mr. and Mrs. X were owning a house in 1959-1962. They then passed away in 1980-something, both of them. And they, uh, they were survived then by their children who subsequently died. And now we are talking about great-great-children or grandchildren who do not even want to vacate the property because he in that becomes a very, very, it becomes a problem because you cannot even follow as to whose house this was in 1968, whether or not after the death of Mr. and, and, and Mrs. X, there was, there was a winding up of the estate or appointment. You cannot follow that up and you will just stay in the house, no ownership and even at some attorneys or attorneys cannot even go back and trace the record. So it's better, it's better to do things earlier and leave the will so that your assets can be divided according to your will. Now, I indicated that Everyone is affected by what is happening in the country. Every single person. There are children after marriage. Or rather, even before marriage. Children before marriage do not differ from children born after marriage or during marriage. You they used to be called illegitimate, but they say that's not a good way and that, that it's not a good name. There are children who were born before marriage and uh, you, go, you get children before you get married and, 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 and you leave your children, you go and get married to a certain person. 
that child has got a mother and a father, although they are not married. What normally happens here is if the mother dies, the child has got a share because the child has got only two parents, a mother and a father. Same applies if the father dies. It doesn't matter whether you died in a certain marriage where the child is not needed. But after your death, the law says that that child has only one parent, rather one mother, and she or he must inherit from the mother. Same applies to the father. Now, the problem comes if you get married to Mr. John and Mr. John dies before the wife. The wife survived Mr. John and after the death of the wife, even the child who was left with the granny can come and inherit because the last person to die is his mother. So it becomes very complicated because children tend to fight and say, when our So when our final inherit. The fact of the matter is the last dying is his or her mother. So that person has to inherit. I can see the complexity of that because if I were not an attorney, I would also raise questions to say, why do you come and share with us when our father does not know you? This property belongs to our father and our father died before our mom. Why do you form part of us here when we are to inherit. So that must also be taken into account when you get married. Now, doesn't end up there. If there is a child who is adopted And that child has been adopted by both parents. That child is your child. It doesn't matter that he, he, does, he or she does not come from the mother or the, the father. It's, a, it's an adopted child who has full rights to enjoy his or her parents' assets after the death. We also get problems in that. When you adopt a child because you had your own two children and this, this one child who has been adopted two, three years ago, one of the parents dies and the adopted child is to inherit. The biological children do not want or rather fight. They want to know why this other adoptive, adopt, adopted ch child is to inherit equally with them. I understand. If I were not an attorney, I would definitely raise that question as well. But I think it is worse if a person does not have knowledge, he can even fight and go to court or rather fight and, 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 and really cause damage when it should not be a, a, a cost. Those areas are problematic, especially succession after the death of the person. It becomes a big problem. Now, going back to marriage and disclosure, when a person or rather, A and B gets into whatever marriage that I've just mentioned, 
And they did not disclose what they had before. They get into that marriage with debts. For example, you get married to Jack when you are, or rather when you are indebted to APSA in the amount of 700,000 rand because you bought a, 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 a property and things did not go on well and you just get into the marriage, you don't disclose that. In law, your partner is also indebted to APSA because you did not disclose that. And when your partner realizes that you came with a bad package into the marriage, he turns around and says, this is not what I thought would happen. And the marriage comes to an end. So, people, I believe it is very, very important for everyone to disclose, especially for our kids, to be our children, to be told to disclose what they have before they get into marriage. Because it destroys the relationship. It also affects the other partner negatively. And life becomes very difficult. I have not been told by Mr. Mdavi as to how long I should talk. Some people say lawyers talk too long. Some say they, 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 they talk too much law. And I don't know whether they will be questions and answers. And if that is the case, I will just end up here and, 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 exp and wait for the questions. that there will be a question and answer session. So the, all the people who are seated, they are free to can ask any question to Mr. Slamnena. So whoever does have a question can just uh, raise up his hand and then the mic will come to where he or she is seated. Thank you. Thank you. I actually got two questions. The first one, you mentioned the issue of matrimonial significance. Now I want to know if the customary marriage, is it regarded as a, is it regarded in the law, number one? Number two, if one walks in with a child in the marriage and then one, one walks in with the child both sides, he and her, when it comes to separate ways in terms of division, does the children count in terms of asset division? Thank you. Yes, I think I understood the question. The first question is the first question is whether or not customary marriage is uh, is recognized. Customary marriage enjoys the same recognition as civil marriage, and no doubt it is equal with, or rather you can equate it with the other civil marriage. There's no doubt. It is highly recognized. The, the second question, if I understood correctly, is if A and B get married, A comes with her child and B comes also with his own child, 
when the marriage comes to an end, he wants to know what happens to the child. I think that is how that is how I understood the question. Surely, surely, when you join the marriage with the child, and she joined this marriage, came in into the marriage with a child, the two children have their own, or rather your child has their own mom, and his child has his own father. Unless and until you decide to adopt these children into the family. The children are not or do not belong to the family full force. They cannot, when you walk out of the marriage, you will walk out of the marriage with what you came with. And, and, and same will go with your partner. That is the only thing that you go with because if you come with a motor vehicle, it forms part of the marriage. And if you come with other assets, they all form part of the marriage. But when it, when it comes to children and not adopted, you will have to go out with your child. Any... Uh, good evening. Uh, actually, I think uh, my question is almost the same with that, but I wanted to understand about this death uh, case of saying when you are getting married to someone with a death, you are also part of the, of the death. So now if I'm now part of everything and now I decide to withdraw from the marriage, is that going with me or I go out as I came? So... <laughs> Thank you for the question. I believe this is a very, very important question. If you listen to me carefully, I said that is the only thing you go with. And the only thing we go with, I was referring to the child. If you go in with asses and deaths, you don't go out with death. The other partner will be affected. No doubt about that. You cannot say, you I don't have to inherit your debts. You came with it, therefore, I'm not there. It will affect you. You don't go out with, when you withdraw, you, don't out, you, you go with half of it, and she will remain with half. In other words, if your name is blacklisted, her name is also blacklisted by virtue of your marriage. Thanks for the presentation. Though it was not mentioned, I wanted to understand the advantage of a, a trust in a family and the will. My, the second one also, I wanted you to also expand in terms, when you started you said, though marriage dissolves, that is not what we are praying for. I wanted you to also expand because for those who are waking in terms of their pension that also when they, when they walk out the issue of pension how is it affected also? Thank you. Uh, I will start with the issue of pension because I think this is, uh, this affects nearly every worker. If you are married in community of property, you share the assets, a 
on the dissolution of the marriage. Passion is also part of the assets which should be shared equally. It doesn't matter whether you started working 15 years before marriage. Upon this dissolution of the marriage, you will have to share 50% of your uh, pension benefit. I did not get the first question, trust and a will. My understanding is that I have to explain the advantage of the will or rather the advantage of the trust. I would really request that, uh, humbly request that you clarify the question. Is that the difference between a will and a trust or the importance of a will and a trust? Okay, for an example, let's say someone did not have a, a will and, and they are married in committee of property and that person passed on without a will. I wanted to get two examples. A person who has a family that has a trust, that, are, uh, uh, that have a trust, and someone dies, what are the benefits of a trust? When someone dies with a trust, and someone dies without a trust, both of them, there's no will. What is the, uh, what is the advantage? Thank you very much, thanks a lot. <coughs> I think what comes to my mind now is that I have to explain who has to make a will. If you are married in community of property and you have a house and a car, or let me not specify a house or a car, let me say you have assets. And because you have a child born before marriage and you realize that life is not good here and you want to leave everything with that child who was born before marriage. Maybe one of the reasons is that there's no child here. Now you go to an attorney. You say, Mr. Attorney, please. I want to make a will. Then you see it. Then Mr. Tenney asks you, what do you want to do? Well, I want to make a will. And what is that that you want to leave with, who, who, with, with, with Mr. John or Mr. Jack? And you say, no. I want to take the house in Springs and give it to my, my child who was born before marriage. And the two houses to my sister who's in Venda. If that person who is assisting you understands this, he's not even going to allow you to make the will. The reason being that you do not own a house in Springs, you do not own the two houses that you say you have in Sante. They are, they belong to the joint estate. You don't decide alone. You have to take your spouse take your partner with and go and make a will. You cannot sell something that does not belong to you. That's one point I want to make. But coming to your question, a trust is different from a will. You can have a family trust where you buy things and put them in, into the trust. They, they belong to the trust. But a will is something that will normally op always operate after your death. Now, if you die without a will, but with a trust, it is not going to really answer the question as to how you're going to divide your assets, or rather, your assets are going to be divided after the death. The trust can remain 
being the family trust or rather be dissolved because of your death. It depends on what type of trust you have uh, created. Any follow-up question on that? If there is a follow-up question. Particularly, particularly going behind your partner, make a will, and you intend to leave something, or rather intend to leave something to your, 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 your brother or your sister. Uh, I just want to ask a question again regarding the will. In my whole life, I've never made a will. So I uh, want to ask, uh, who's keeping the will after? Okay, the lawyer, maybe will go to the lawyer. He will keep the will. And let's say maybe I have passed away. You know, in this world, there are those bribery things and stuff. Can anyone come after I have passed away? Since, okay, let's say maybe my friend knows that I went to lawyer, so and so. I made a will and say maybe go there and change things and maybe bribe the lawyer. Is that possible or like those kind of things? Thank you very much. Uh, what is not possible in this world? I, I, I think anything is possible, but <laughs> and I'm not saying that an attorney will be bribed because an attorney is one person that I know cannot tell lies. Um, yes, if I were to advise you where to take your will to, I would advise you to take your will to your bank because I know after the death, the first journey by your surviving spouse will be to the bank. So that, that I would do. There are, you know, offices of attorneys who are well advanced, who, who can keep your will because there are a lot of partners and it's not something that can come to an end. The, the death of Mr. Lawyer does not mean the closure of his office. But I would advise you to go to your banker and put your will there. They will explain as to how much you pay per year and, and, and it will be safe there. I'm not sure if the question that will follow will be that the bank manager will be bribed. I don't know. Good evening. Uh, I just want to know something. Uh, as we are praying not to divorce, but if something happens, we decided to separate and there are children in the marriage. As the parents, we agreed that we are not going to divide our assets or some of the assets. We rather give them to the children and then we just part ways. I go this way, he goes this way, but the children, especially maybe the house, the children are going to occupy the house. Is it allowed? Thank you very much, ma'am. Thanks a lot. <coughs> I think we, we, we come across this nearly every day where one partner, not because of love, perhaps because of greedy, he or she does not want the property to be sold and would rather do everything and anything for this property not to be sold, but it must be kept for children. The law says that the assets we're talking about here belong to the husband and wife. Some people go to an extent of bad naming other partners for the sake of having children on their side, believing that they will get a house because they are staying with children or they've got custody of the children. The law says 
that the property you're talking about belongs to you and your husband. But nothing stops the agreement. If you agree that you are parting ways and that the property should be registered in the name of the children, the presiding officer is not going to tell you that your agreement is invalid. It is only in the event you don't agree that the law takes its own course. To answer your question, ma'am, you can agree and put it in writing. Nobody is going to tell you that your agreement is invalid. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. So my question is again based on the separation part where they were, okay, A and B are married and within the marriage they incur debts and it happens that, it so happens that A is a foreign national and then A decides that, okay, now once they've separated with the debts, that were incurred within the marriage, A goes back to their country of origin. And as they go back to the country of the origin, what I want to know is, um, are they now, what, what then happens to B that's left in, in their country of origin? And what happens also to A? Uh, let's say A goes back to the country of origin and then changes identity, for example. Um, yeah. Questions based on that. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thanks. Remember the debts or debts are not divided. If it's 500,000 rands, it is incurred by A and B. B is not indebted to the institution in the amount of 250,000 rand. It's indebted to that institution in the amount of 500,000 rand. If A pays the 500,000 rand, then all of you are off hook. <laughs> but if you pay the 250,000 rand and Believing that you will tell whoever wants money to say, I've paid my half. <laughs> there is no division there. You go to go and look for, B, for A in the, in the foreign country. And he must assist you in paying the debt. Because in the country that incurred debt, you still owe 500,000 rand to the institution. That's what the law says. Uh, before I can ask the question, I just want to discourage all the questions which have been asked. Uh, this question of uh, separation for our people of God, I think if we are joined together by God, I don't think that we need to look at separation in the first place. So, what I'll say, uh, my question is that uh, is concerning the will. Yes, uh, in terms of the will, uh, we black people who are not used in, in signing the will, and we don't know anything about the will. But uh, what I can say is that uh, most of us who are working, and then uh, we depend mostly on our pension fund or provident fund. And then every year we receive our statements showing that you got so much in your provident fund. And then also you are given a, a sort of a, a form to fill whereby you can say your spouse, you give uh, so much percent, your children, you divide that 100% according to your family. Is this uh, a will, if I can put it that way? If I've signed that form and then hand it back to my provident fund or uh, pension fund, 
is that a will? Is not, there's no need for me to go to an attorney or a lawyer to just sign a will. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> now, the pension fund, pension benefit, we call it pension benefit. Say you have accumulated 250,000 rand pension benefit. And you get that form that you have just mentioned to say that um, your child, child A will get so many percentage, child B this percentage. I heard you mentioning your spouse, your wife, to say you also indicate that she, should you die, she will get so many percentage. Let me talk law there. I have already indicated that pension benefit forms part of the joint estate. You cannot decide how many percentage your wife or your husband should get. Your husband has got 50% of what you have accumulated, whether you like it or not. You have 50% by virtue of marriage, only if you are married in community of property. So, that is not a will. It is something that has to be managed by trustees who, after your death, will have to give your child A, a certain percentage, and your child B, a certain percentage. Don't even go towards your wife or your husband. Who gets to inherit the property? Two young young people, it could be ladies or gentlemen, they are friends. They decided to buy a property together. The other person is helping the other one so that they can qualify or something like that. And then they go, they get married. After that, there's children in different marriages. The other part passed away. What happens? Thank you very much, ma'am. I regard this as one of, um, how, how, how should I call it this in Zahi? One of the best questions that I would really, uh, I think I expected that question. <coughs> this is not marriage. It is called co-ownership. There is a disadvantage there. A disadvantage of being a co-owner in a manner she has just explained is as follows. Some people cannot qualify on papers to pay, but financially they do qualify. You just help them by submitting your salary advice for the institution to approve the purchase of the property. And you don't contribute a cent throughout because all we needed from you is to submit that salary advice in order for the other friend of yours to qualify. I said there is a danger and disadvantage on that. When you, a genuine owner of the property, die. The person who hasn't been paying anything in law will qualify to inherit 50%. <laughs> I repeat, there is danger there. <laughs> but there is, a, there is an advantage. If you did not qualify financially, don't allow someone to make you qualify on paper and it does not cont contribute because it will definitely end up not good after your death or after his death. 
Now, the question as to who inherits. Remember, you are the co-owner of that property. If the value of the property is 500,000 rand, he is entitled to 250 and you are entitled to 250. If he dies because you told me that he died, his children will be entitled to half of the value of the property. I hope that is well answered. I agree to all in the name of Jesus. My question is based on business side. If, for instance, we go into a partnership and for some reason the business doesn't work out but incurs debt, and in that partnership is 50-50, and we decide to sell it with debt, I want to know if the debt part, is it divided or not? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Listen, if you are partners in business and they are both 50% shareholders, I cannot see the difference between this partnership and the partnership we were talking about, that of co-ownership and that of marriage. In this case, surely the main aim was to get profit and to share 50-50. Now, why when things go down, you don't go down together? You have to share the debts. I just want to do a follow-up question. Let's say, for instance, the debt incurred is 500,000. And we are in this business 50-50s. My question is, does this debt mean I owe 50% and the other partner owes 50%, meaning 250 each? Or we are all liable for that 500,000 until he's paid up. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think, I think this question is similar to another question that you just asked me. Remember, you are 50% shareholders, both of you. And you cannot indicate as to how much your partner or how much debt your, your partner has incurred. It is very, very difficult to do that. You can't do that at all. So obviously, being 50% shareholders, it follows that you have to go 50-50 even in debt. That follows. There's no doubt about that. It, 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 in actual fact, in actual fact, it doesn't matter who was working hard and who was lazy. Whether, even, even in profit, if you, if, you, if you accumulate a lot of money, being shareholders, obviously you're going to share 50-50 profit. So there's no difference here. You're still going to share 50-50. And even if it's 500,000 rand, the company CCJ, um, incorporated in case this much and shareholders are A and B. You owe the 500,000 rand. So I can't see the difference here. Uh, greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is I just want to know about the lifespan of a whale. How long, uh, how 
the, just the lifespan, how long does it take, for, does it expire and all of that. And the second question is, if you have a life cover and you pass away, does the will supersede the life cover? Can it so supersede, can it take, can it be preferred first than the life cover or are they treated independently? Uh, the third one is, if you, let's say both couples are in business um, with other people and um, you didn't write anything and then unfortunately, let's say you pass away, how do the children inherit from, from that, that other external business? Can we write a will? How, how can they benefit from them? Thank you, thank you, sir. If you draft a will today and you do not, you don't, you leave it as it is until you reach 96 years, that will does not expire. As long as it complies with the act itself, it does not expire. The only thing that will change this will, the, your will, is another will. If you, if you want to change the will and, and, and for example, in your will, you indicated that House A should go to your brother. And your brother dies before you. Surely, that clause should be changed. And you can draft another will. Or change that clause, obviously, that is equal to, change, to drafting another will. But if you don't do anything, if you don't change, you don't write another will, so that the will will remain, it doesn't have lifespan, does not expire. The, que the other question did, has got something to do with the life cover. And the question was, does the life cover supersede the will or vice versa? A life cover has got nothing to do with a will. But you can indicate as to who should benefit after your, your death. That helps. That helps a lot. It helps a lot. I'll tell you why. If you have got a life cover, with Metropolitan and is quiet about the beneficiary. That life, the, the proceeds of the life cover will have to be wound up with the estate. In other words, the lawyers, the attorneys will have to request that amount into the estate late account. And you will have to wait until the winding up of the estate is finalized for you to get what is entitled, what you are entitled to get. But if you say, in the event of my death, I want the amount to be given to my son Robert it will go straight to your son, Robert. One of the disadvantages of not specifying is as follows. When the lawyer winds up the estate, he charges you according to how much he is dealing with. 
They will tell you about the 3.5% of the value of the assets. So if you direct your monies to the beneficiaries, it really saves costs of the estate. It doesn't go all to the lawyer. It really, whatever will be limited will be dead. But directing it to the beneficiaries is one of the best advice I can give to any client. No, we, the will and life cover are not the same. Perhaps you can say when drafting your will that the life cover uh, the amount proceeds of metropolitan life cover should go to X. But you can also do it there to avoid, you know, drafting it in a way. So, they are not the same, although there is a relationship. If you say something there, that, that will go in accordance with your will. That will be, that will be paid in accordance with your wish. The third one has got something to do. I think the third question has got something to do with a business. If I understood the question well, you are saying you are a partner in a business and you die. What happens? Um, we dealt with previous questions, I think, it had something to do with shares in the business. Surely what we will do here is to go and check as to how much share did you hold in the business. And we will deal with that share. If it's in terms of the percentage, we will immediately deal with your share of the business. I hope it's answered. If not, any follow-up question? Uh, thank you. Let's assume it's, uh, it's me and you. It's father and son. There are no people here. You are advising me. I'm about to get married. <laughs> In terms of the marriage con uh, contract, which one in your opinion, do you think is the best? It's father and son talking. You are advising me. Pretend as if you are not here. <laughs> Give me a room and I'll sit down with my son and advise him. But I will not just advise him with, before asking him questions. I'll definitely ask him questions and, uh, and uh, 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 advise him or tell him the advantages of matrimonial systems and he has to choose therefrom. My son, it is good to get married. I really would encourage you to get married or married at your age because it has got a lot of advantages. When your children grow up, you will be able to play with them and you will be able to take them to school at your age is good. However, there are three systems or three matrimonial systems one is in community of property. If you are marrying, because I know you are marrying for the first time, I cannot see the reason why you go for the, this marriage called out of community of property. It really indicates that you are greedy, you are hiding something that the other partner does not have to enjoy. But 
if she doesn't have a problem with that, you can enter into that marriage of out of community of property. However, the disadvantage thereof is you are not going to control her because she will be building your own estate and you will be building your own estate. In other words, if she comes back at 12 o'clock midnight and you say, where do you come from? She will also indicate that I'm partnering with other people to make business because I don't want to die poor. I'll go further and advise you, my son, and say, if you are married, because, but now, I'm not very sure because I stayed in Cape Town for a long time and you now grown up and I don't know you much. If you are married, you are marrying for the second time and you had access for your children born out of marriage with the other lady because you were married and you don't want to lose this property in the event of divorce. Sure, you can sign what we call anti-nuptial contract, leave everything that you had with your children, get into this marriage out of community of property, start working from zero, and you will share in the event you divorce. So, because you divorced in 1986, you can divorce now in 2013, you will keep on sharing. So, and you can enter into a customary marriage where you send me, but I won't go, I'll just send my brothers to go and pay Lovola. And upon the dissolution of the marriage, it will be the same as marriage in community of property. So that will be my advice, and I would request you to choose. I won't advise you which one to choose. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Asnam Lena. I think the church, uh, they want to go on with the questions, but unfortunately the time uh, is a little bit limited. What I will urge is the fathers, you have seen um, the respond. So I think you need to uh, do another session where you call the speaker um, to another father service so that we can expand this, uh, I mean this, uh, this topic. However, we want to thank you very much. I think there was uh, a father who was agitated to ask a question. I will only give him two minutes. Only two minutes. Okay. Uh, greetings in the name of Jesus. Okay. You explained that uh, when you are signing a will, uh, maybe for a property, it's not your, it's not you only supposed to go and sign a will. You have to go with your partner to sign that will. Uh, in the event that you go and sign with your wife, and then uh, maybe, unfortunately, she dies, and then you decide to go back and change the will. Is it acceptable? Thank you very much. Two seconds. Yes. <coughs> um, remember, when you, when you went to, 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 to really, um, uh, as you indicated, sign the will with your wife, that was your intention. In the event I die first, this must happen. And in the event we die simultaneously, this must happen. And in the event she dies before me, this must happen. Now, it depends on the content of the will itself. If really, really it affected her, then you can change. Remember now, there are wills that you cannot even change because you say, in the event my wife dies before me, I will take care of the properties 
for the children, for our children and our grandchildren. And the third or fourth generation will have to register that property in their name. That will, you will feel when you go to change that you are not honest to your wife. Because that was an agreement. You can stand up and go and change that, but surely it won't go on well with you because you are not being honest to your, to your wife. You were talking about the third or fourth generation. Now she only passed away last year and you go back to their lawyers and you change everything. Yes, you can change. Nothing can stop you changing that. Thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate. I think um, as a church, we are enlightened. We are more knowledgeable in, the, in terms of uh, these laws. So I hope um, we'll do better in our, in our, in, in our spheres. Um, can I see the hands of those who said uh, we want to see Mr. Snamlela for the second time coming and uh, empowering us. It goes without saying um, the fathers, you have seen the response and uh, we must thank you as a church for organizing this. Mr. Snamlela, you don't need an invitation. You have seen um, the request from the church. Fortunately, when it comes from the church, you don't have to say no, yes, no sir. So we'll take that as a uh, has been you are invited to another session.